And in here he says, listen to this, as far back as 1958, brochures for Chrysler Imperials trumpeted autopilot, <laughs> describing an amazing new device that helps you maintain consist- constant speed and warns you of excessive speed. That year, an article in Popular Science opined, like it or not, the robots are sli- slowly taking over a driver's chores. Anti-lock brakes have been available since the 1970s. Electronic stability control, a system that uses data from multiple sources to selectively apply the brakes on specific wheels of a vehicle to increase control in terms, has been available since the 1990s. In many vehicles today, driver assist systems automatically apply a vehicle's brakes to avoid a collision if the vehicle system determines there's an immediate risk of uh, collision with another vehicle. And automated parallel parking systems take control of a vehicle as it is parked. You know, I saw one of them demonstrated. We did this um, cross the country tour, and we used to do that in the summer. And we went to the Ford plant because they didn't accept the stimulus money in the Midwest, and they were demonstrating them. I guess they were just out around that time. Not a fan of that either. If you can't park your own car, if you're too lazy to do that, I could just see the guy that I think has to use this. He's probably got Velcro on, doesn't tie his shoelaces. I don't know if I've ever had a producer that wore Velcro. That might be worse than the flip-flop. The flip-flop is just, you don't care. The Velcro is, you're just out, that's it. All right, uh, attorney Quentin Brogdon is joining us here on the Dom Giordano program to break all this down. Uh, Quentin, welcome to Philadelphia. Thank you for joining us. Where are you located? Hey. Good morning, Dom. I'm, I'm in Dallas. We've got a muggy day here today. Uh, I don't know what your weather looks like. And, and for the record, I do not wear Velcro shoes. <laughs> okay. Are you one of those white? You know, where did that ever come from, the white shoe lawyer firms? Are lawyers used to really wear that many white shoes? I guess so. I haven't seen white shoes in a while. Uh, I know, but you, you hear that Washington. all the time, you know, uh, that they're going to put him in a white shoe lawyer firm uh, that's old money or something. But you're on the front lines of this whole thing. I'm fascinated by this because it seems to me these people think we're in the age of the Jetsons already, and there's going to be consequence for this. As you point out, Dom, uh, as your astute writer points out, that would be me. <laughs> The automation of our automobiles has been going on a lot longer than most of us realize. And it's not that the age of so-called AVs, autonomous vehicles, is coming or on the way. It's here, mm-hmm. whether we like it or not. And many, including myself, we would argue that we're rushing into this without fully perhaps understanding all the ramifications of it. The idea is these are going to be safer, you know, over 90% of automobile accidents are caused by human error and the theory at least is once you have robots making decisions robots don't get tired they don't get intoxicated but we're introducing new errors into the system these systems have failed uh, particularly involving tesla been a series of spectacular tesla crashes and so we're, we're transitioning right now and we're really in a partially autonomous phase and I, for one, you know, some people are going to die who would not otherwise die as we perfect these systems. If I'm next to a big 18-wheeler that the U.S. Postal Service is testing on the road, I don't want to take one for the team. No. You know, the, the, the beta version of it uh, is yes. being you know, the debug. Uh, so it's a concern. Oh, absolutely. I mean, just the idea of the driverless truck coming down the highways, what could go wrong? Now, in here, in your line of work, too, is the idea of you have various people saying that products liabilities laws, uh, I guess, has to adapt to this. Others are saying they seem to want this so much that I, I get a feeling that they're willing to throw away some of these protections. There's kind of a back and forth over this. There's a debate in legal circles right now about how exactly we should deal with this, whether it should all be federalized, namely, you know, in every, all of the 50 states, one set of rules. Uh, many, including, again, myself would argue that that throws out the baby with the bathwater. We'd be giving up rights in jury trials in some circumstances. And our existing system has adapted to airplanes and, 
uh, all kinds of new technologies over the years. So the idea we just need to throw all of that out, I think, is misguided. Well, absolutely. And I'm trying to think, now you're this day to day. My theory is, look, for some people that are disabled, sites, things like that, I get it. They want independence. I see limited usages there. But what's driving this, though? Is it just uh, the automobile manufacturers wanting some new thing? Are there people really that just want this because they think, uh, what, they're lazy, they don't want to be thinking about driving, and they think the computer is superior? What's driving it? Well, I think there are, you know, well-intentioned folks who rightly point out that, you know, if you're blind or drunk or you can't necessarily access an Uber, it would be, it would be, you know, a great theoretical world if you could just jump in a car and it would safely drive you from point A to point B. So there are well-intentioned folks, and the government has put the full weight, uh, you know, on on their websites and elsewhere. The government says, you know, this age is coming and basically we bless it. But what is really driving it is profits. Profits, particularly in this trucking uh, thing, trucking is a seven hundred billion dollar industry, and a third of those costs are spent on compensating drivers. And there's a huge shortage of truck drivers right now. So if we can use autonomous trucks, we can save money. We can address the shortage if we're trucking companies, Mm -hmm. if we're shippers. And so there's an economic motive. And then you have companies, Tesla and others, who are racing Toyota and spending literally billions with a B of dollars to race to the front of the line because there are potentially big, big profits here. If you get to the front of the line and you develop and perfect this technology, we are, and make no mistake, as a society, as we allow this, we are, you know, specifically deciding some people are going to die and they already have who would not otherwise die because of malfunctions in these computer systems. They have failed. People think they just operate on GPS, but GPS is only accurate to a foot or two. And, you know, a nanosecond error in GPS throws it out of whack by many feet. Just a nanosecond of error and they can be hacked. And there are all kinds of problems and issues. I've even read terrorists looking at that, uh, you know, self-driving cars, hack into them, uh, fill them with uh, various explosives, and then turn them loose. That's right. There was a movie, and I don't recall the name, with Charlize Theron, where she hacks into the system and starts making all the autonomous cars in the future go to a specific intersection and, and, you know, basically pile up in order to to achieve some other goal. So those are the kinds of things that that we really have to approach with open eyes. Well, here's here's a bigger thing, too, and it's a real dilemma because, you know, I'm a fan of technology. You are, too. It makes life better, quicker, and all that. But we are coming to a point, and Tucker Carlson on Fox talks about this a lot, second to none, you mentioned jobs and long-distance trucking. Well, maybe they have to pay people more. Cutting out jobs of all these jobs that are here, that's one of the biggest, that there is skill involved, but it's a different type of skill. With robotics, you know, there is going to come a point of crunch here for millions and millions of people. That's right. I mean, and, and that's yet another issue. And, and there are ethical issues as well. Whose life will the computer on my car be programmed to save? If you potentially can save my life during a crash by steering up on a sidewalk, but putting pedestrians on that sidewalk in danger, should the autonomous vehicle do that? Should it be programmed to do that? That's an ethical issue. Mercedes and others have decided, well, we're going to put a premium on the life of the person inside the car. But that's an ethical decision. And, 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 you know, what kinds of assumptions will the robotic system make about the actions of other drivers? Early systems assumed all the other drivers would follow the traffic laws. Well, what could be wrong with that? <laughs> hey, we're in Philadelphia. You're in <laughs> Dallas. You can imagine here with that. Oh, my God. Well, uh, Quinton, thank you. Thanks for this. Thanks for the piece, too. And, and where do people find you? Where's your website? My website is Crane, C-R-A-I-N, Lewis, L-E-W-I-S, dot com. Thanks for having me on. Uh, Thank you, uh, Quentin. Hope to speak with you again down the line. And uh, are you a Cowboys fan? Uh, absolutely. It's not easy to be one. It's a lot easier to be a Philadelphia Eagles fan. But, yeah, I, I'm I'm, a, I'm hanging in there. I, I don't know why. I ask myself that sometimes. You got Jerry Jones there, and uh, I bet he'll have the first driverless car that's functional, maybe. 
<laughs> Thanks, Quentin. Thanks no for doubt. joining us. Quentin Brogdon here on Talk Radio 1210.